Susan? Yep. So, yep. Yep. Thank you. So the year 2000 was obviously marked by the pandemic and 2020, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so only 20 years behind, so I didn't get too fussy with that. Um, and you know, I was, I was kind of reading during the week that a number of people, even some really prominent people have kind of predicted what was going to happen, but not Exactly, you know, but a lot of people were saying that it wouldn't be long that we would have this great pandemic hit us. And, and they were even comparing it to uh, 1918, the, the Spanish flu. Uh, 50 million people died from that. So thankfully, that hasn't happened to that degree yet. But uh, people predicted it, but not very exactly but they didn't do too badly, some of those people. But most of us were surprised, and you might say not ready. And that's not just as individuals, that's just as communities and governments and everything. So I was thinking about today, uh, title is Predicting 2021. I was thinking about things in the Bible where predictions did come about, did happen. So we have the flood, you know, the, the, the Noah's flood. Here's Noah. God says to Noah, build an ark. Noah's building the ark. All these people are just living life as, as you know, life happens. Uh, they see him doing this, but he, they go on with life. And the flood came. And Noah and his family were the only people that were saved. Then I was thinking of Joseph's dream. We talked about that in detail about more than a year ago. Joseph's dream. Uh, he, he dreamt, didn't communicate it very well, but he dreamt that his whole family uh, would be bowing down to him one, one day. And sure enough, a number of years later, that happened. Sarah, um, in, you know, Abraham's wife Sarah and John, uh, John the Baptist's mum, Elizabeth, both of them were, were women who were sort of way past the normal age of having children uh, and, and they were promised children and they had children and in both cases there was some unbelief around all that but it happened we know that in lots of places the prophets predicted things about Jesus his birth his death and so on and then Jesus himself said that he would die and rise again and it happened but despite all those things happening and despite some predictions coming true for some people um, lots of things are not predictable now I saw this during the week and I thought we would just have a little bit of fun I saw this with the guy. David, if you could get that link up, please. Um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so I think surfing is, when you look, watch surfers and waves, it's just amazing. Um, <laughs> So, so there's a little icon that takes you to a link. Just bear with us a sec. No. It wasn't automatic. Pardon? It wasn't automatic. Oh, sorry. That's all right. After 30 days, I could not believe my before and after picture. I literally rolled back the hands of time. You don't want to skip that. Hi, I'm Richard, and this is the prediction. What I'd like you to do is lean forward and place your finger on the start square here. Now, during the 
test. Awesome. You can move Could you from it? side to side. Could you just take it a fraction back and then pause it, David? Sorry. That's it? And, and then let it play now? Oh, I see, yeah, it was nearly at the start. You've got to keep going left. Drag the dot all the way back. Well done. That's the way. Okay, that's great. And, and, and just pause it when I tell you. Okay, so I'm going to ask a volunteer in the... I'm going to ask a volunteer. Can I have a volunteer? You've got to use this little gadget, but I'll show you what to do. It's just so, this, this will point at the screen. That's what I want. So that's all you have to do. Someone? Do. Tim, would, Tim, would you like to have a shot? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so just point it to the screen. And when, it, when he starts to give you instructions, just try to follow his instructions. So just let it play now, David. I'm Richard, and this is the prediction. What I'd like you to do is lean forward and place your finger on the start square here. Now, during the test, you can move from side to side. You can move up and down. You can visit a square that you visited before, but you mustn't move diagonally. Okay, make one move now. So the moment you have your finger, either on this square here or this square here, keep it exactly where it is. Now every time I say a number, make a move. Remember, up or down, side to side, but not diagonal. Here we go. One. Two. Three. chosen the house over here and here we go again one two three and now i predict you won't have chosen the v here we go again one two three four five six seven and this time I predict you oh, won't no. be on this symbol. Here we go again. One, two, three, four, five. And now your finger is not on the arrows. Here we go again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you haven't chosen the unhappy face over here. Here we go again. One, two, three. And you're not on the wavy lines. Make one last move now. And I predict you didn't choose the cue, but instead your finger is on the happy face. And that is the prediction. Okay, so one more person. Thank you, Tim. One more person. Hi, it's Adam Surplus from Molly Flow, and behind me is yet another. Come on. What's the matter with you? I, I can give you some instructions of how. There was, there was one thing I should have pointed out. No one wants to have a shot? Come on. Thank you, Sarah. I just press, press that. What, one thing that you can do that I mean, I've learned from doing it is um, you can go into the blank space, you know, like after he's taken the paper, you can go into that space um, as long as you just do it one at a time. Sorry, we're just going back to it. <laughs> What I'd like you to do is lean forward and place your finger on the start square here. Now during the test, you can move from side to side. You can move up and down. You can visit a square that you visited before, but you mustn't move diagonally. Okay, make one move now. 
So the moment you have your finger either on this square here or this square here, keep it exactly where it is. Now every time I say a number, make a move. Remember, up or down, side to side, but not diagonal. Here we go. One. Some of it might not be very flattering, um, some of it might. But the whole point about all that is that there's not a lot that we can predict in life. We can guess or we can assess and work out the chances that something might happen, uh, but we can't predict with certainty. You know, we, we assume that we'll wake up tomorrow morning, uh, you know, when we go to sleep tonight. Don't know that for certain. Yeah. We assume that during this year we'll do what we've been doing last year. You know, we'll be going to school or going to work or doing our grocery shopping or staying in touch with people. Uh, but they're all assumptions that we will keep doing those things. If we ask people, and some of some of us might have got caught in this, that you know, did they get hurt by the global financial crisis? Yes, a lot of people did, like in their superannuation. They suddenly found that their funds had lost value and they didn't predict that. Um, and that was, you know, an unfortunate thing that happened. So time and chance happens to us all, which is you know, what Ecclesiastes said. Ecclesiastes 9, 11. Time and chance happens to us all. But this is what James 
saying it's in James uh, chapter four. If you can have that first slide, please, Beth. James chapter four. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to do a certain, uh, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay. That's particularly relevant for us now. Town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business and there we'll make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. But James goes on to say, next slide please, David. What you ought to, to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. If the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. What does the Lord want of us in 2021? And today we're starting a series uh, with five P's in them. We'll run right through to the five weeks of January. The five P's. Now, predicting, I just stuck that in at the start just to, um, yeah, to make you come to the service today, actually. Mm -hmm. Predicting 2021. I thought everyone would want to know how can you do that. Uh, well, I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, David? But we are going to talk about Predicting today, planning next week, planning in 2000. Black didn't come out very well. Preparing, because we, we have to plan, because if we, if we don't plan, everyone else will plan uh, a year for us. We have to prepare. If, if we don't prepare, we won't do the things that we need to do well. If we don't pray, well, that's, you know, that's a no-brainer, you know, we're, we're all Christians, we're all people of faith, we know how important it is to be in relationship, in, 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 um, in regular relationship with God, constant relationship with God, and priority, so important because there's always much more that we feel that there is to do than we can do, and God doesn't expect us to do more than we can do, but we have to work out what our priorities are. So that's what is in store for us for the rest of January. And Scott and I will be sharing in those. But today, because we're talking about predicting, um, and we've already concluded that most of, most of life is not predictable, not with certainty, uh, I just wanted to share four things with you that God's people have always believed to be important uh, and to, to get on with this. Now, these are not the only four things. Uh, after today, you might think about lots of other things that are also fit into this category of things that we need to be getting on with. But I want to talk about four things. And the first one it's about, uh, so I'll tell you quickly what they are. Uh, to do what God wants, and we're going to look at, at a parable of Jesus for that. To know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I explain more about that. To form authentic relationships, and to make disciples. Four things. So, first one, do what God wants. Now, there are, in, in Matthew chapter 25, there are three uh, parables uh, that Jesus gives that are really significant parables and they've all got something to do with uh, being accountable. That, that something's going to happen and it's, it, it, it portrays effectively that one day God is going to call people to account. And the three parables uh, all uh, speak to certain things. And this is the middle of those parables. 
Uh, it's, it's what we know, what, what we know as the parable of the talents. Um, the parable of the talents, well-known parable. I think some of us probably grew up with this in Sunday school. It also happens in, in, um, in the Gospel of Luke. Um, and we're not going to read it. It's fairly long, but this is what happens. Uh, a man is going away for a long time. He says to his servants, and he gives his servants a number of talents. He gives five to one, he gives two to the other, and he gives one to the other. And he says, you know, go and make use of these talents, and I'm going to come back and ask you what you did with them. So the first one goes... And he invests his five talents and it, it doubles. It becomes ten talents. The second one goes up, he invests his two talents and it doubles and it becomes four. The third one goes off and says, uh, I'm not sure what exactly my master might be expecting, but I want to do the right thing. And he goes and buries it, makes sure that it's secure. Uh, the master comes back. He commends the first two people, but he condemns the last one, the one that buried his talent. So when we're, when we're looking at this now, I grew up, in, in fact, not just grew up, I, I think for a very long time, I, I saw this, uh, of, you know, like you've just got, you know, God's given you, um, you know, gifts and God's given you talents and you've got to kind of use your talents. And interestingly, and I think this is true, I read about this, but I'm sure this is true because because uh, the Bible has influenced a lot of English language and English language's uh, uh, definition of talent kind of comes from this story. Um, but in the story, the talent is just a, a, an amount, it's, it's a description of money. And it's a big amount of money. I think the Message Bible might say $5,000. It's a large amount of money. And so that's what the Bible, uh, sorry, that's what the English Dictionary might say. And that's in a common sort of understanding. That's what uh, we understand by, by this, um, this parable. But it actually means it's much broader than that. It basically means, and this is where it comes back to the two, the first two people, um, that these people got on with the things that they that they knew they had to do. They uh, were responsible in the way they used what had been given to them. They went on and did something about it. They took risk. Uh, they were uh, were prepared to be innovative. Uh, they might have searched, you know, they, they might, things might not have come quickly, but they were determined and they made sure they got done what they needed to do and they tried to do it well. And, you know, if, if you think about this for us, it's about pursuing life. We, we all know the things that are important for us to do. But it's about kind of um, like a Nigerian, uh, sorry, a African friend uh, used to say, you have to take the bull by the horns. <laughs> but that's the kind of, that's the kind of idea. Uh, you know, get, get on with it. Get on with it. That, that's what we're expected to do. And, and these people did it. Now, don't get the idea from that that we have to be uh, really uh, totally active. We have to be so entrenched in our activity that that is the measure of whether you were, whether the master was going to commend you. That's not, it's not about activity. It's, it's about being active, but it's not about activity. And it's because we know that in our world, and it happens to all of us, that we... That becomes a frenzy. We can get into a frenzy and then we say, we're too busy, we've got too much to do. The point is that we get involved with all our hearts doing the things we should do, but we don't do everything. Uh, and that is the sense and that is the way that 
God wants us to live. And these two guys uh, did that. Now, let me also say this. It might be that in being the five talent or two talent per uh, people, it might also be that we have to review how we we uh, spend our, our Sabbath. And, and, and for me, Sabbath is a rhythm that God has given us from the, from the creation and that if we don't have a rhythm in our lives where we come back to God in a regular way and we reflect on what we've done and we reflect on our work and we reflect on the future and the past and if we're not continually doing that in, in, in a sense of in a rhythm we will fail one of the really essential things that God wants us to and when, when God calls us to live for him and live with him, he builds Sabbath into our lives. So part of that investing of the five talents and the two talents is about taking account of what Sabbath means for us and building that into our lives too. But the fact is, these two people were commended by their master. Uh, they did the right thing. They got on with it. They, and yes, they took risks. Uh, because faith has risk. It's not just about total caution at every turn. It's interesting that the Message Bible, and, and I've come to see because of reading Eugene Peterson's books, so he wrote the Message Bible, uh, he translates this, you know, when the Master commends these people, he says, be my partner. It's like the Master says to the servant, be my partner. It's like God saying to us, be my partner. It's a commendation. It's kind of saying, you're with me. Come with me. Let's, let's do more. Let's get, let's get things done. Be my partner. I like that. But the third person was judged. And, and he was not just judged because, you know, he was judged as being lazy, but he was actually judged as being wicked. Uh, was it such a wicked thing that he did? Well, it seems to be that there was a sense that he couldn't be bothered, that he kind of just, well, you know, I'll, I'll do the careful thing, but he didn't look far enough in terms of what he was given to do. Uh, and and he, he was worried about doing the wrong thing, so much so, that he didn't do anything positive. He went and buried it, because he said, oh, my master would, yeah, I don't know, but... Master's not totally talking about predict, predicting. But, you know, I don't know how my master's going to see this, so I'll just make sure that it's safe. And he did the safe thing. And he was condemned. He was condemned. Uh, it's not good enough, God says. He, he misunderstood what God was like. It was not good enough. So that's number one thing. Get on with the things that God wants us to do and check in with him so that we're doing the things that he wants us to do, as James said. Second thing, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, let's have a look at um, the next verse. Yep. So, from 1 Corinthians uh, 6, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honour God with your body. Now, uh, that is uh, Anna McGahan. I, I talked about her about a month ago, and that's the book she's written. Uh, Metaniah means repentance in, in Greek. Um, great, raw, honest story of what she was like and how meeting God transformed her. Uh, amazingly raw. Um, and one of the things, because the, 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 uh, the little kind of subtitle of the book says, a memoir of a body born again. Because she, in lots of ways, abused her body. Something triggered when she was a teenager, and for 10 years she, she really abused her body, and she describes it very, very uh, honestly. And then 
when she came to be connected to God, and it was just a slow process, but a very deliberate thing that happened in, over a number of weeks, uh, months, she came to understand this verse, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And she said she had to learn to love her body and say sorry. And I wanted to read, read you uh, this because um, I've, I've never quite thought of it like this, but for her this was incredibly significant. She says, But on that bright morning in St Kilda, standing in the shafts of sunrise, that pain was gone. I looked in the mirror, I saw my temple for the first time. I was in a truly remarkable body. I sat on the floor and I held my limbs. I hugged my stomach. I stroked my own skin. I whispered, I whispered to my form, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. She asked her body to forgive her because of the way she had abused it. Um, so, so look, the quick story of all that is it started with anorexia, but that was only an indication of things that was going on in her life. Um, that, that, that was kind of the, the trigger, and then this, she went into this long journey. So, uh, continuing. She started to treat her body, she, tre she started to treat her body properly, and she, she calls it, I started to serve my body. And she says, are you hungry? What do you feel like? A walk? Some sleep? I will give you what you want. When she was hungry, so she being the body, her body, when she was hungry, I fed her. When she was full, I stopped. When she stumbled, I let her rest. I let her sleep instead of giving her stimulants. Slowly she learned to let go. She learned to trust me as I learned to be trustworthy. God had made himself at home and called that home good. I had no choice but to believe him. She was my home too. For the first time in 10 years, I didn't want to be anywhere else. I stopped vomiting immediately. Eventually, I started eating sugar, fat, and meat again. My weight stopped fluctuating because my metabolism could finally be at ease. I had room to think about something other than food and exercise. I had room to find my body fascinating and attractive and complex because I knew her and knew she was all those things I had the capacity to love again. From that morning, after 10 years of utter hell, I was healed. Um, and the, 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 the point of that, and it just brought it home to me, and it, it, it really does connect with the first point that we shared about using what God's given us and using the opportunities God's given us, which I know that uh, Don in his um, prayer this morning talked about, thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that are ahead of us. That connects really well with that, that whole uh, parable of the talents. But when, if we want to do what God wants us to do, we do that also understanding and acknowledging that our, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. That's the starting point. That's, it is the Holy Spirit that wants to glorify God in the bodies we have. And what do our bodies do? Our bodies are what carries out the, the things that we think about, the things that we think we ought to do, the things that we uh, hopefully think rightly we ought to do. Our bodies, hands, our feet, our bodies carry those things out. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we need to respect our bodies. We need to give our bodies to God and say, here I am. This is me. Here I am. Use me. I will go with you wherever you want me to go. Wherever you take me. Whatever you want to teach me. Whatever 
I must learn. Uh, and when when that gets hard, you know, um, uh, Margaret and I were we we try and have a kind of a sort of a review day at the beginning of the new year. And as we were talking about that on the first, uh, we were talking about how. Um, you know, we go, like the Psalm 23, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. So some of the where, some of the places that God takes us, and might take us, might not be easy places. But if he's going to be there with us, we can do it. We can go. We, you are with me. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The, four, the third thing is about build authentic relationships as the people of God. So let's have a look at the next one, David. This comes from Colossians chapter 3. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself, clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Now, again, I have to... Um, refer to this book uh, uh, this, this, this book kind of blows my mind because it shows me what a person who is totally not, doesn't understand the church and we have, don't we know this we have lots of people around us that don't really get it. Now sometimes sometimes it is, it is because of misconceptions there's lots of misconceptions uh, people just don't really get what church is or what, what God is about. And she, it, the way she talks about her first introduction to Christians reminds me of that, uh, you know, in an amusing way. But, you know, I've been, I've been going to church since, I've been conscious of going to church since I was about five years old. I was probably going to church even younger than that. Um, so I sort of feel like I, I'm, I'm used to a lot of churchy things. But um, she wasn't, and a lot of people aren't. And what she says, what struck her about the Christians that she met, so she went to church, but then she started seeing these Christians in little groups, you know, she'd go out to, um, oh, what's the, what's the thing that people like? Oh, Chinese. Um, Yum -yum. No, 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 it's the, um, it's like a sweet thing. <laughs> Pardon? Dumplings. Dumplings, thank you go out with a group of people who have dumplings and then she'd go to Bible study and uh, get to know people and she was observing people and just kind of, kind of this is all new to her and sort of watching how they, how they reacted. But, but what she said was, they were, now remember she was kind of like in this industry, like was, I mean, she was an actress and there's all these kind of people a bit like her, creative people and that sort of thing, probably all had a, you know, there was great expectations and there was a real need for her to portray a certain person. That, that was her struggle. But she said, they were, all, they were all normal. You know, they might have been talented, but they, they were normal, these Christians that she uh, came across with. And they weren't pushing, um, they, were, they were not pushing God on her. And it was almost like she wanted to get involved because she saw the way they, they reacted, and their normality, their uh, wittiness, and, and all the, the kind of things. She, she had these expectations that they would be something different to that, but they weren't. They were normal. And it just reminded me that 
Uh, and, and I count myself in this, that we are so used to being part of church uh, that sometimes it's possible that we portray something that is religious but might not be always normal about ourselves. Now, I know that that's a journey, but it's about being authentic. And God says that his people need to be authentic. This, this is all about authentic relationship. And that also takes me to another thing, and that is that we, what we're doing here is really important because we, we gather together. But we're only doing this for about an hour and a half, once a week. We, uh, and Scott and I have been thinking about this even before the last year started, before COVID started, uh, and we will talk more of this, but we want to encourage our church to build more on small groups, cluster groups. You know, we've already started these cluster groups that work really well as we were trying to encourage people in COVID. Now we, we are asking that we build on that. Small groups, you know, anything from three to six to eight people. I would say not more than eight people. So that we can be intimate with each other. We can be honest. We can speak the truth. We can speak the truth about the things that we're not as much about the things that we are. We can get support from each other. We can ask for prayer. We can be really honest. And it's those relationships that will, will uh, strike the people around us and say these people are different. They're normal, but they're different. They're real. I want, Scott and I would like to encourage us all to get involved in smaller groups where we can really be ourselves and um, let the message of our Christ in all its richness fill our lives. As we talk about uh, Christ, when we talk about the Bible, we talk about our lives, and we build and we grow in our relationship with each other. And may that spread to the world that we are trying to reach, to the community that we're trying to reach. Build authentic relationships. The last one uh, that I'll finish on is make disciples. Now, I've been telling you about, um, uh, you know, trying, encouraging you to read the Gospels last year. And I'm really encouraged that a lot of you have done that, and I know some of you have done more than my gospel. It's fantastic. Maybe we can take that up and read a second gospel this week and keep it going. Keep this. The last two verses of Matthew, which I've been looking at, is, is Matthew 28, 19 to 20, where, where Jesus is with his disciples before, before he, after his resurrection, he says, all authority is given to me. Go into all the world and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that um, I have commanded you. Make disciples. Uh, Paul in 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says what he says to Timothy, what Timothy is like a young pastor that Paul has been mentoring, what I what you've seen me doing, what I've taught you, go and entrust to faithful people. Paul is saying to Timothy, keep making disciples. So the point of that is that that's what God asks us to do. That's what Jesus asks us to do. To look for opportunities to make disciples, to build into our lives disciple making as a normal part of our lives. So we 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 try and show people as we come alongside them, and it might happen in those small groups I was talking about, but the people that we know that we want to disciple, we show them. We don't just um, invite them to a study. That might be part of it, but that might only be a small part of it. We show them what it means to live for Jesus. And, and it's a regular, committed thing that we do. Build that into our lives. Um, that is what we are called to do. I want to finish with this, which which came out of a... So there's this um, this guy that I've, I've been reading lots of his blogs, a pastor, and people reply to the things that he reads, to the articles that he writes. This is what someone replied on this whole context of, is it just about church attendance 
or is it about making disciples? And this is what um, this, this person wrote in. And, and this is not necessarily un, uh, unusual or something that you haven't heard of, but I think it still makes a great point. True discipleship cannot happen apart from close connection and it takes time. However, with enough time, discipleship has a much bigger payoff. Think about this. If I found someone new every day and convinced them to come to church for 25 years, I would have invited approximately 9,125 people to church in that time. 9,125 people. But if I took a year to feed into one person's life and really disciple them and taught them to go forth after the year was done and do the same so that we both went in year two and found one person each to disciple and taught them to do the same and so on and so forth for the next 25 years, we all would total 33 million disciples being made after the 25th year. 9,133 million. And that's the difference between uh, multiplication and addition. Disciple making is about multiplication. It's a difference between discipleship and attendance. Multiplication compared to addition. May we all focus on making disciples in the year to come. And we are going to sing a song which, because this is such a powerful song, and I've probably introduced this song the same way many times, I don't, I don't like to sing it a lot because I feel like it calls us to such a strong commitment to, to what God wants to do in our lives that sometimes by singing it, we might almost cut, you know, sort of sell ourselves short. So it might be a song that even as you sing, you might want to really reflect about because the words are very powerful. Uh, Hosanna, I see the King of Glory. Let's sing it. 